the other day and get it and get it to put it where it's supposed to be mailed. Yes. Take I have to keep an eye on people. And what I would like to do, Dave, before we start, if all the children, so all the guys under 18, <laughs> can, who, are, who are not actually sitting down and listening to the program, so all the children, could you all come down the front because I want to have a chat with you. Is that all right? Now, now I just want to point out some things. Firstly, the, the venue that we've got here is like gifted to us. People, somebody gives it to us and they're really generous in doing that. Um, but there's a lot of things been happening yesterday in particular that I wanted to just talk about with you. And because it would be nice if we could treat the venue a bit more lovingly. Do you know what I mean by that? Like, because what's been happening is like, you know the curtains over there, some, sometimes you're twirling around in them. Some of you remember doing that yesterday? Twirling around in the curtains. And my, by the way, there might be some others uh, who were here yesterday that are not here today, so it might not have been always you. So don't, if it's not you, then don't take on the blame for that, will you? And, and, and what happens, though, is the curtains are quite expensive. So, so if you break them, you know who will be paying for them? Your mum and dad. No? <laughs> you are. <laughs> so um, also there was a food fight that went on outside. And then some, some come along and squash grapes and everything else and it's pretty messy and, and a lot of the people here volunteer to clean up, right? So, so they, they've got to clean up that mess and, and they volunteer their time to do that so, so they're cleaning up after, right? And then there was also, there was a stack of chairs and some of you were jumping from one chair to the other chair, right? This was happening yesterday. You, you know who you are if you were doing it, it doesn't matter. And um, all I'm saying is that all of those things are a bit dangerous as well. And if someone falls over and hurts himself and a stack of chairs falls on top of them, you could get quite seriously hurt. So what, uh, and also um, because it's raining today, going in and out all the time means you're going to be trundling in some, maybe some wet or mud on your feet and everything. And then there's carpets here that need to be cleaned. So a lot of things get really dirty by doing all of these things. And what I'd like you to do is just to think about whether those things are loving. Does that make sense? So not telling you off, but just asking you to think about whether those things are loving. Because when we come along to the groups here, what we're trying to do is just is, is to work out what's loving and what isn't loving and work our way through those things. And, and in the end, a lot of people have to tidy up if all of these things happen. Does that make sense? And so if you could just bear that in mind today, there's plenty of areas to play. Also, last, uh, last time some went upstairs where we're not meant to be going, where, where it says private, and opened uh, the locks on the doors, and, so now, and then we didn't know that, and we, we went away thinking there was nobody upstairs, and the doors were open, and the doors were left open over the week, uh, over the week because we didn't know. Does that make sense? And that means that somebody else could have come in and taken some gear from here. All sorts of things could have happened with that one. And so what we want to do, because we have this as a gift, we want to treat it really good, you know. Like when you get a really precious toy, like you, you don't want anybody destroying it, do you, or jumping up and down on it or anything like that. And you could think of, it, you could think of this auditorium as my toy, my toy, because I like being here and, it, and, I, and I, it's a precious to me. Does that make sense? So if today when you're doing stuff, if you could just bear that in mind, there's plenty of things to do. Uh, outside in the dry, there's all around the auditorium, obviously, all around the outside and stuff. But if you keep coming in and out like yesterday, not only what happens is not only is a lot of the adults that you know that you know how hard they find it to concentrate, you know, well, a lot of them get very distracted, right? And uh, and you know that a lot of them like get so distracted they got no idea what's going on half the time when when you go in and out and make a lot of noise, right? And so they, I know you have no trouble, like that's easy, but, um, but a lot of adults have trouble concentrating as well. So if you could just bear in mind those things for me and think about what's loving when you do things. And if you've got any ideas of what you would like to do that, that could take your interest, that could be interesting for you to do while you're here, that isn't going to be damaging, then why don't you either come to myself or Mary... You know, you've met Mary. There's Mary there. Isn't she pretty actually today? <laughs> right, there she is. All right. And um, that's, that's Mary. And what we can do is we can work out what we can do to make things more better for you to come because we still want you to come along, right? Um, but uh, I just wanted to uh, uh, raise those things with you because, because if, if those things keep happening, sooner or later somebody's going to get hurt. 
and also sooner or later um, some things that are fairly hard to fix are going to get damaged and we don't want those to happen because actually what finishes up happening is myself and Mary want to pay for those things so we finish up paying for those things which really mean that everybody here pays for those things because the donations we get pays for these the, the different damages that occur you see so if you can bear that in mind as a as lo as an act of love towards each other and towards me that would be really lovely and now i would like to talk to your mums and dads actually is that all right because mums and dads have got something to work through with this as well so we'll talk about that as well is that okay so you understand what i'm saying so try and stay away from the food fights here if you can too because right? other people have to clean up afterwards and and then it get, and when you're walking around outside everything gets sticky because of squash grapes and everything else and then you know people walk that stickiness in and then we've got to look at cleaning the carpets and all those kind of things and i know the venue isn't quite as as maybe child friendly as it could be but that's the beauty is that it's a gift to us so that that's what i'm always bearing in mind that it's a gift to us and if we can treat it as a gift that would be really good can you do that for me? That'd be great. Well, let's, uh, let's have a chat. You can, you, you can do anything you like now. That's fine. Let's have a chat to your parents now. All right? And not just to the parents, um, but I want to ask the parents three things. Is that all right? Why do you not notice what your children do? All right. So that's something to look at yourself as parents. Why are you not concerned about your own, tr own children treating the venue unlovingly? So there's got, there's got to be something emotionally going on there, doesn't there? If you're not noticing or being concerned that these things are happening. And then the third thing, uh, the third thing I'd like to bring up for you is that your children are reflecting some of your own unhealed emotions about um, things about things being good or about money or there could be lots of other linkages here too. Just when you get together with a group of people you find fascinating, you forget that your children are actually with you as well. It could be quite simple as that. There's so that just if you can look at, all I'm asking you to do is just to look at the emotions inside of yourself. So I don't want you to go away now feeling like you've got to punish your children or in any way. But what I would love for you to do is to look at the emotions inside as to why those things are not being noticed by you as the parent because it's really important that you as the parent knows, notice those things as your own law of attraction. And, and the kids, the kids have, um, we, we can come up with lots of suggestions and we're open to suggestions as to what the kids can do while they're here. And obviously when it's raining it's a bit harder because you can't go and can't go out in the car park or anything like that and and you'll get wet and muddy or whatever but but there are things that we can organize but this isn't going to ever be a um a crash a child <laughs> a crash sort of thing a child a child mining service because really every parent has got to be responsible for what's going on with their children so can you guys you'll be right with that if you can bear that in mind and uh, and also, um, we're, I'm happy for you to enjoy yourself totally. Just be really loving with each other too. You know, not get too. Sometimes things get a little violent with each other too. And if you can just bear that in mind while you're here too, just to think about that. Why you feel upset and angry with somebody when you get upset and angry, and that that'll mean that when it comes to a food fight or something, one of you at least will stop doing it, and that means the other person needs to address what they feel. Is that okay with everyone? Yeah. Now, now some of you stay, have been here for a while and there's other children that come along and, and they're only here once or twice. And if you can talk to them about what I've just said, that would be good. And if, if not, then we're happy, myself and Mary are happy to say it all again too. But, it, but at the moment, what's, what, what was happening yesterday was starting to get a bit sort of out of hand really. Like, and, it, and it wasn't very loving to some people who had to clean up and things like that. Is that all right to bear that in mind for me? Yeah? Thanks, guys. Thanks. How did your parents feel? Can you just, um, if any of you want to make any comments? By the way, Angela. Yeah. Uh, I, I wasn't aware, you know, so I'm obviously one of the parents who's not wanting to be aware of yeah. what their children are doing. Yeah. 
um, and I didn't hear any stories or anything, you know. I was aware of the noise up the back, which I <coughs> addressed, you know, once or twice, but I've also got this thing around our children having free will. Yes, yes. <laughs> and I'm really stuck with it a lot of the time. Yes, many of you are actually stuck with that issue and I want to talk about that as a complete discussion for four hours actually about yeah. free will. <laughs> yeah. The the okay. issue is is obviously f the way God's given us free will, if this is just a general comment, yeah. the way God's given us free will is we're allowed to do whatever we want. So the children are allowed to wreck everything in this place. Right? Yeah. But... With the way God's created her laws, there are consequences to a person breaking the law yeah. of love. So if, the if a child decided to wreck something in the place, then they're breaking a law of love. And yeah. if they're breaking a law of love, then as a parent we need to be yeah. very, very mindful yeah. of, of the law of love being yeah. broken yeah. and to start addressing that. Not in yeah. a punishing way, but actually looking at the reason why they would do that. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. A lot of times the reason why is because they have either a feeling that they can use everything and mum and dad will fix it for them if it breaks. Yeah, definitely. So there's yeah. often those kind of emotions. There's often yeah. also emotions from the parents that they have the same kind of emotion as the child is reflecting. So something to look inside of ourselves as parents is how do we view things that are nice? Do we view them as a gift? Do we look after them? Or, and, and how is that looking after reflected? Is it oppressive to our children or mm. is it actually based on love coming from me? So when everything's based on love coming from me as a parent, then what will happen is our children will be very sensitive to breaking anything to do with love as well. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so with regard to free will, bear in mind that yes, your children are allowed to have free will, which means they can wreck everything here. Now obviously we're not going to last very long here if, no. if our children do that. Does mm. that make sense? Because yeah. there will be a consequence. Yeah to that action. And so what we need to do is look at the fact that God actually created a whole series of laws that deal with consequences to unloving actions. Mm -hmm. So the law of compensation, which some of you have already learnt about, yeah. is about yeah. the consequences that happen when we choose to do something that's unloving. Yeah. So, so there needs to be something set up as parents where when our children choose to do something that's un unloving, firstly what we do is we look at our own unhealed emotion that's yeah. being triggered. Yeah. So we might feel ashamed or we might yeah. feel angry or we might feel that they were justified or yeah. whatever. And we need to allow ourselves to work through those emotions. But then we also need to help our children come to the point of love as well. Now, our children can come to the point of love a lot more easily than we can as parents generally. Yeah. Because they yeah. often are a lot more connected to their soul, so yeah. they they so often just a chat like we've just yeah. had now, can you can work through some issues like that and dig into the emotion that they were feeling at the time. The key is to not punish them for their actions, because all that does is yeah. is set up a whole yeah. series of controls. Yeah. But you do need to have consequences for actions that are unloving, just like God does. And you need to explain to your children that actually when they chose to actually do an unloving act, so the unloving act, for instance, might be something like throwing a heap of food around in somebody else's property that somebody else had to clean, clean up. up. So it's not unloving <coughs> throwing the food around. We, we have an abundance of food here. Um, it's not an unloving act throwing that around, although it could be mm. depending on who... Yeah. created that food and yeah. what the effort they spent in that food. Yeah. Do you know what I mean yeah. in terms of yeah. respect? Yeah. But let's say that the food was just fruit that somebody yeah. picked up and, and, they, and, it was, and it was free and spare yeah. and they threw that around. The unloving act is towards the person yeah. who has to clean it up. Stephen, are you listening? Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So the unloving act is not, not necessarily throwing the food. So yeah. if they're out in the paddock throwing the food around yeah. and having a food fight, that'd be fun, right? Yeah. And, and you squash it all over yeah. each other and, yeah. you know, like, you know, then have a wash off in the outside yeah. or something, There's, there, that's fine. Yeah. But as soon as somebody else has to tidy up after you, yeah. now it becomes an unloving act. Yeah. Can you see what I'm saying? Yeah. And the key is to allow yourself to actually work your way through, all right, when has this become an unloving thing? Yeah. Either to the person themselves or yeah. to yourself as parents or to others. And then to address that from an emotional perspective rather than from a physical or punishment yeah, perspective yeah. or reward-based system yeah. perspective. Yes. Yeah. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. Yeah. So, so if you can do that, what happens then is you're respecting the law of free will, but 
you are also teaching your child that every time they choose to break the law of free will, there is a consequence yeah. that God automatically has imposed through the law on their soul. Yeah. So there is a consequence of breaking the law of free will. And if we as parents can teach our children there's consequences to breaking those laws, then by the time they get to a teenager, they'll already be very sensitive to God's laws. Yeah. They'll be very sensitive to love and they won't ever break the laws of free will. And ironically, that's when they have the most free will. Because understand that every time you yeah. break the law of love, you actually impact negatively yeah, upon your own free will mm. because of the soul damage that mm. occurs to your soul. Yeah. Yeah. And if the children, and most of the children it can easily understand this principle when you explain it to them, that every time they break a law of love, there is a soul damage on their own soul that will then need to be looked at at some point in the future. And if they can prevent that from occurring, then they can do anything they want and there'll be no damage to them whatsoever. Yeah. Um, and that's without mummy or daddy even being around. Yeah. And without mummy and daddy even noticing, yeah. there is still yeah. going to be a damage if they choose to do something that's unloving. Just like if mum and dad choose to do something unloving, yeah. there's a damage to mum and dad. So <laughs> if, I understand that, but so if, like if I feel I'm not... Um, like I, t I say that mm -hmm. and I feel like I'm, you know, like I, I, I guess somewhere I'm just not emotionally owning the thing. So it's not a, from coming from a, a really vulnerable, um, I don't know, pl a place where they get it. Because right. a lot of the time I have to, you know, speak again and again. It's really, it's often about their rough and tumble, you know, that just goes on or the noise that just goes on and on. Everything the child does is a complete reflection of the parent's unhealed yeah. emotion. So what you do as a parent is before you even speak to the child really, yeah. one of the things you need to do as a parent is to address the issue inside of yourself emotionally as to what, yeah. what does it trigger in you. Because our, our children are perfect reflectors yeah. of un, our unhealed emotion. So the first thing is, what does it trigger in me? So, so when my children are playing and they're really, really noisy mm. and I'm trying to concentrate doing mm. something, mm. The, trigger, the trigger usually there is I'm feeling unloved. Yeah. Does that make sense? As the parent, the parent's yeah. feeling unloved. Yeah. Yeah. And, so, and then the, because the parent's feeling unloved, they then make... Uh, you know, they then yell at the child, say, stop that noise, <coughs> which is actually an avoidance of the parent feeling yeah. unloved in that yeah. moment. Now, when the, when the parent stops, uh, when the parent deals with the unloved emotion, the children will often, if they are very sensitive at the soul level and they don't have much damage themselves, they will very often automatically stop what they're doing. Like I've had, uh, I was in a beach in Miami once and um, I was laying on the sand and I don't know if you've ever been to Miami beaches but there's like 100,000 people packed on the beach. <laughs> um, so if you can imagine that, like there's no spare space whatsoever hardly. I mean there's a beach there and, and I was laying on the sand and these two children came up and just started kicking, they were playing and they kicked dirt all over me. And now it's tempting for me to just get up and have a growl at them, right? and say, what are you doing, sort of thing. But all I did was I just <coughs> sat, I just laid there with all this sand getting kicked over me, closed my eyes, of course, and just let it happen and just let myself feel the emotion mm. that was coming up in me as a result of it. And as that emotion came up, uh, now those two children were being unloving, mm. okay? Now mm. that's obviously something going on with regard to the soul damage that's already there in them, yeah. right? However, what I did was I just allowed myself to feel what it was like for me and I got quite triggered by it actually and, and felt initially some anger and then connected to some sadness inside of me about, you know, I was innocently just laying there do, not doing anything and all of a sudden these people are, you know, damaging my space, you know. And as I worked my way through the emotion within about, uh, it would have been 15 seconds after my, I even started the process, the children instantly stopped what they were doing and just walked away. Yeah. Right? And they didn't come back and kick sand over me, although they did kick sand over some other people <laughs> <laughs> later on, does that make sense? Who obviously had the same law of attraction as what I had. So I suppose what I'm trying to illustrate from that is that our children are very sensitive uh, to any emotional damage we have. Mm -hmm. And it's very important that we focus firstly on the emotional damage we have before we focus on trying to correct yeah. our children. Now, yeah, well, that's what's been going on for me. Yeah. I've, you know, just... 
the last thing I want to do is to squash them or project at them to or get to angry. To so I, I but, don't, but, but they're but just getting away with it. But there is the issue, though, still of correcting yeah. any unloving behaviour. Yeah. Yeah. So, I'm going. So, <laughs> so I know the balance is difficult. Yeah. But, but if yeah. you – and a lot of times as parents we get fri quite frustrated with ourselves here because yeah. we know, oh, well, they're reflecting yes. something again yes. Yes. and they're not listening again. <laughs> again, that's and right. how does that feel to you? And yeah. the key is to fully go into that feeling as a parent. Yeah. So, so when our child isn't listening to us, for example, yeah. um, what – interesting your child, how your <laughs> child's responding now. What, what's the response do you feel? Like for those who can't see, Angela's child is, is hugging her and giving her a kiss, right? And there's an Angela emotion that's driving <laughs> that. Um, what are you feeling? I'm just feeling lots of unloved emotions. Yeah, and that's projected out and your child instantly loves you. Does that make sense? Like she gives you the love. So that I don't feel that? Or well, the truth is you're not allowing yourself so, to feel yeah. the unloved emotion. Yeah, you yeah. are actually projecting it outwards. Yeah. And okay. your child's responding okay. to that projection. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. When you own it completely, she'll be able to just sit yeah. down next to you and watch you yeah. cry without yeah. having to give yes. you a hug. Okay. Um, I, I see this happen all the time where, you know, a, a parent gets into an emotion and the child comes up and hugs them out of the emotion. Yeah. And actually the parent doesn't realise in that moment that they're actually not feeling the causal yeah. emotion. Yeah. They're actually wanting to avoid the causal emotion yeah. and the child's just reflecting that back yeah. to them. Yeah. And the parent goes, oh, isn't it lovely? They're <coughs> giving me a hug. No. And in reality, the parent's just actually taught yeah. the child to... to yeah. To Substitute more. Uh, no, to actually nurse the parent. Stress, yeah. No, actually, yeah, right. Yeah, because yeah. the parent doesn't want to feel their yeah. own emotion. Yeah. And so, so I've also seen where we've had conversations, and it's interesting now I've brought that up, she instantly left yeah. you. Um, but but um, it's interesting, even while I'm having a conversation <laughs> with parents, it's wonderful having children because when mm -hmm. you have a conversation with parents, the child reflects every emotion the parent's denying at, in the conversation as it's occurring. So I've, had, I've been conversing with people and while they're connecting emotionally, the children are just playing quietly. All of a sudden they st stop a connection and all of a sudden the child comes up and pulls their nose and pulls their ears and takes their glasses yep. and all these <coughs> other things just distracting them. And then as soon as I address that emotion, the child just goes away without them having to tell them what to do. And it just like, it's like a play almost yeah. okay. in most cases. But it, 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 the beauty of having our children in that space is that, is that they are reflecting perfectly to us mm. everything I'm denying right at that instant. And if we can bear that in mind as parents, we can powerfully mm. work through our own emotions. Um, the problem is that as parents, we often are in denial of our own true emotional state. Mm. So what was happening just earlier is that you are actually in denial of this state, which is this terrible feeling inside of yourself of, I'm actually feeling very unloved. Mm. And what you're doing is you're feeling some grief, but it's not actually causal grief. Mm. It's, it's like the grief of please love me, please love me, that kind of a grief. And oh. that's being projected to everyone around you. Yep. But the most <coughs> sensitive person that received it was your, what, how old is she? Nine. Nine. She's the most sensitive one in your yep. family to it. And she just comes wham, wham, up, yep. gives mum a kiss and yep. a hug. Now mum's feeling loved. Yep. And that whole chance to deal with that causal emotion just is yeah. gone yeah. in that moment yeah. and so and so what we need to become aware of as parents is that is that every single thing that happens between us and our children is the result of a law of attraction and most of the time a lot of the time is the result of an unhealed emotion in the parent yeah and the child has <coughs> learnt through this yeah. process to respond yeah yeah okay. does that make yeah. sense yeah no it's yeah. It's spot on. And so when it comes to it, can I just address the issue of free will though? So yeah. free will, just bear in mind, any free will, you have the free will to do the most unloving act you can think of. God gave you that free will, right? So whatever is the most unloving act you can think of, maybe murdering someone, you've got the free will to do it. God, God doesn't say you're not allowed to do that. But what God does do is ensure through the law that there is a consequence to every single action that breaks the law of love. And so the, the time when free will is in most harmony with itself is also when free will is in most harmony with love. And what, you're, what we're all learning to do here is to learn to use and exercise our free will in total harmony with love. Yeah. And once we do that, there is no pain, there is no action that creates pain in ourselves and there is no action that creates pain for other people even though they may feel pained by the truth 
There is no action that creates pain. And on top of that, the beauty of it is that I am now always connected with God because every single thing I do is harmonious with God's laws on a matter. Yeah. And the, the, the way God's created all the laws is so that anything that I do that impacts another person's free will is, is the thing that creates the penalty. So, so if I can illustrate that. While I'm doing something with you that's harmonious with love, I am not harming your free will at all. Because, no. of, because of that, my free will is being exercised totally harmoniously with love. Yeah. The instant I harm your free will in any way whatsoever, right? Mm. so in other words, I'm using my free will to dominate your free will, yeah. that is the instant my soul receives the penalty yeah. right at that moment. Yeah. And so the way God's designed her laws is I cannot have my free will independently of the universe without there being some consequence if I damage yeah. the universe. Does that make sense? Yeah. <coughs> and it's a beautiful, when you see the law like that, you see how beautiful it is. There's no way we can get out of it. There's no <laughs> way we can avoid it. There's no, yeah. but, but what happens with the free will discussions most of the time is we say, oh, but they've got free will, meaning in our own mind, meaning they're allowed to do whatever they want even if it's, even if it's unloving. And the truth yeah. is, yes, that I'm saying mm. yes, that is true. Mm. You mm. are allowed to do mm. whatever you want, mm. even if it's unloving. Mm. However, you need to understand that mm. right at the moment you do it, mm. there is a consequence that is applied across onto your soul of mm. damage on your yeah. soul, on your own soul, that you will have to release at some point in the future. Yeah. And when we understand that relationship between free will and the other person's free will, then we can see why that occurs. Yeah. If I'm exercising my free will to damage your free will or to control you, manipulate you in any other any way, even emotionally, I can't, it yeah. might not even be words. I can just be manipulating you through my free will emotionally. I am automatically going to have the damage occur to my own soul as a consequence to that. Yeah. And, and that is where now I'm using my free will in an unloving way. Yeah. And as soon as I exercise free will in an unloving way, I am going to have to clear that at some point in the future inside of me. And there's always a reason why I do it, by the way. The reason why I do it m might be all sorts of unhealed emotion. I might yeah. think I'm better than you. Yeah. I might think I'm worse than you. Yeah. I might think I'm, you know, there's all these other reasons mm. why I do it. Mm. But in the end, all of the laws of God are built around when I harm somebody else's yeah. free will. Yeah. So that's something to bear in mind. Yeah. So while I have free will... If I say to myself, I have free will and damn the rest of you, mm. now I am harming your free will yeah. and there is always an automatic consequence yeah. upon me yeah. for that. Yeah. Thanks, AJ. Hi, AJ. Um, as a parent, I, I really struggle with that thing you've just talked about where yep. I've talked to the kids yesterday and this morning, mm -hmm. completely ineffective. Yep. Because totally. you know, I've got so much suppressed emotion around how they're behaving, and um, can we go into some of that emotion? Do you yeah, mind? Yeah, sure. No, that's fine. Um, let's yeah. let's go into some of it. Yeah. So, if you stay in this conversation with me, yep. what was one of the emotions you felt? Um, I was angry. Okay, so remember <coughs> anger. But that's very suppressed. Is the layer over fear, isn't it? So, yep. so all of a sudden, you know that you're in this space. Yeah. So let's look firstly at why why you were angry. I might just grab another. Pen. Why were you? Did you know why you felt a bit angry? Well, you know the children are pretty wild, and I saw the potential for someone getting hurt. So, um, were you embarrassed? Yes. Is yeah. that how you spell embarrassed? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, were you also felt a, f a fear about safety? Yes. So there was yeah. a you a, a fear, shall we call it, yeah. about safety? Yeah. That wasn't huge. Yeah. But um, probably embarrassment. Embarrassment was the biggest one? Yeah, one of them. So let's yeah. put that as number one. Yeah. Yeah. Any others that you can think of that come up for you? Um, I was aware that they're disrupting people. So uh, you were worried about what other people thought? Yeah. Um, yeah. So fear, <coughs> fear of judgment? Yeah. Shall we say? Yeah. And by the way, a number in the group were judging, quite a number in the group were judging mm. yesterday. So, so that's uh, uh, that you, the parents were receiving that judgment, <laughs> right? Yeah. Go on. Any others uh, that you can think of? Just feeling like an ineffective parent, you know. Okay, so not a good dad. Not a good dad, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and going down into feeling unheard, unappreciated, not listened to, and down into okay, so what are your children? So your children are not yeah not a, so you you're not heard yeah uh, not appreciated yeah not respected all right yeah, all those things not respected that's a big one by the way not respected many mm. parents have that mm. yeah, going on yeah not respected um, can you see how it's quite easy to get a list of emotions, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so now your anger is the result of not wanting to feel these emotions. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when we deny the, ex the feeling of those emotions, which by the way is the creator of the child's behaviour anyway, ironically. Yeah. Right? What happens is we, we express yeah. the anger to the child generally. Mm. Or, or if somebody points out our, our, our child is doing something, we may even express the anger to the person who pointed it out, one, one of the two. Now, the key is to actually start addressing these emotions in the situation itself. And you'll notice, uh, this is very powerful if you're a parent, because if you start dealing with a situation the immediate, in the immediate place that it's happening, what will occur is that your child's behaviour will instantly change, which indicates that you've hit the right thing. Now, one of the things that the, most, the rest of us have as a problem is that we don't often know when we're hitting a causal emotion. If you have a child, you instantly know when you're hitting a causal emotion because their behaviour instantly changes as a result. Mm. So that's the beauty uh, of having children. Now, and I say one, it's one of the beauties, obviously. There's many others. All right, so we have fear, and then underneath the fear, of course, is the grief, right? You will find, as a parent, that all you need to do is acknowledge these fears even and your child's behaviour will instantly begin to change. Right. You, you don't even need to permanently get to the grief. You will notice that when you start acknowledging these fears and you go, ah, oh, this is about, I'm feeling embarrassed now. The instant you say, I'm feeling embarrassed now, there's something that goes on inside of your soul and that is an allowance of the embarrassed feeling. Up until that time when you're in anger, you're not allowing the embarrassed feeling. Mm. So therefore, nothing can change. Yep. When you allow the embarrassed feeling, now all of a sudden you've got this feeling passing through you, this embarrassed feeling. And now your child isn't feeling it from you mm. and will automatically change their behaviour as a result. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and they don't, half the time your children have no idea that they're triggering you. Mm. No idea at all. And, and the reason why they have no idea is it's totally unconscious on their behalf because all they are doing is reflecting the unhealed emotion, the parents, or not just the parent, by the way, they're reflecting our, or the audience's unhealed emotion too in an audience situation because they're feeling the environment perfectly, mm. perfectly feeling the environment. So, so the key is instead of getting into the anger place, all right, say, so, all right, I'm in anger, so I know I'm in denial. I'm in denial of my fears. So what am I afraid of? All right, let me look at some of these emotions that I feel. I'm embarrassed, okay. The key now is to acknowledge firstly to yourself that you are embarrassed, right? And why am I embarrassed? Oh, there's a number of reasons. I might feel like I'm not a good dad, I'm not, you know, this, and, and people are, you know, being disturbed because of my children and we have a bit of ownership sometimes with our children as well and we call them my children and everyone else points the finger and say, they're your children, and, you know, that your children did that sort of thing. And we have a lot of that embarrassment that comes from that projection and judgment. And so what finishes up happening is... In the end, we start to get away from these emotions because we don't want to experience these emotions as a parent in the situation. And the only alternative is actually to get angry after that, really, in the end. You know? So the better thing to do is actually in the situation, this is my child, all right? First step, me always feel my emotions. Second step, always deal with unloving behaviour. Right? The first place I start with unloving behaviour is in myself. <laughs> Right? So an unloving behaviour in myself is I've got an embarrassed feeling but I don't want to feel it. That's an unloving act. What I'm doing is projecting it in that moment. My children are sensing that embarrassed feeling and triggering it even more through their behaviour. And all I need to do is feel this embarrassed feeling and all of a sudden I'm in a loving space. I'm in a truthful space and a loving space inside of me. That automatically is going to make a change with what my children are feeling from me. Automatically without me addressing anything. But then when I go to speak to them, because I am feeling my own emotions, 
they will actually hear what I'm saying to them. Now, every one of your children just now this morning heard what I was saying to them mm. because yeah. I'm feeling my emotions and therefore not projecting at them any of those particular things. Right. Does that make sense? Yep. So yeah. let's, uh, my suggestion is now go through a list of those things and then let yourself relate that to your own childhood, mm. right, and your own parents' projection at yourself mm. and link it back. And that way you'll finish up getting to the grief. But even if you would just allow yourself to see your fear, it will have a positive benefit on the child. Yeah. So, so that would be my recommendation. Firstly, always feel what I'm feeling as the parent. Mm. Secondly, always deal with unloving acts. Uh, but uh, make sure that I'm owning the emotion while I'm doing it. Yeah. yeah. So often I will say like, uh, and I've said to my boys uh, when they were much younger, you know, this is all, I can see this all comes from me. Like, you know, the reason why you act a certain way towards women in, 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 is something to do with my emotion here and I can see you know when I've pandered towards women all my life I've now taught you how to do that mm. do you know what I mean and I'm owning my own emotion while I'm speaking this and then but I'm saying but even though that's the case while you do that you are treating yourself unlovingly just like I was treating myself unlovingly do you know what I mean and I can go into that mm. and it, and these things apply right across the board with our children so even like our children let's say our children never clean or tidy their room Instead of going in and just yelling at them, tidy your room, you know, you're not getting dinner until you tidy the room and all those kind of things. What, what does tidy room mean? It means that they have some worth, some self, sense of self and a pride of their environment. Now, if I've got no pride in my environment or a sense of self-worth, I am going to live in a pigsty. So if my child is living in the pigsty, my unhealed emotion is to do with some self-worth that my child is obviously experiencing. So the first thing I do is I allow myself to start feeling my own sense of self-worth. Do I really have a sense of self-worth or do I just tidy my room because I got yelled at by my mother and father for 15 years about it? Do you know what I mean? Mm. And I deal with my own sense of self-worth. Now I have some personal pride in my environment. I will automatically desire a clean environment. Now I'm not projecting that at my child. Then if my child still is untidy, now I know it's their sense of self-worth, which is the same emotion that I've actually given them through their life. Mm. And then I help them actually develop some self-worth about themselves, about how do they feel about living in a pigsty. And once I work through that emotion with them, now they will probably clean their room without me saying a word. Mm. And I've done this quite a lot with children, obviously, in travelling around with people and staying with them. So... And, and I remember one person who was an adult, actually, by the time I got to them. Um, but he was always smelly, like, personally. Like, you know, lots of bad odour, smell. His clothes always smelt and everything. And instead of saying, look, I, you just stink all the time, which is tempting, right, because you can't bear the smell, right? So instead of just saying, you just stink all the time, um, we need to... I, instead, I said, look, the truth is that your clothes and yourself are very smelly and it's really hard to put up with. That's the truth. But I don't want to talk to you about that. What I want to talk to you about is the reason why it's like that. And the reason why I feel it's like that is because you don't value yourself very much. You don't have any sense of pride in yourself. And as soon as I said those words, an adult man started crying. And he started working his way through some of the emotion of what happened when he was young and so forth about his own sense of worth. Now, the very next day, he got all of his clothes, disinfected a lot of them and washed them all. And he did that without anybody telling him. The very next day, he went through his entire room, which, by the way, he was staying in another person's home. He went through his entire room and tidied the whole thing up because it was, it was a mess. The, when I say it was a mess... There wasn't a single space on the ground that you could walk on without treading on some of his clothes, right? And, and other things, food and other things, right? And then he was staying in a house as a guest and making this room like that. So obviously a lot of not very much sense of worth. And once he started working away through his worth, he automatically changed his behaviour. Now, our children will do exactly the same as that. Mm. Yeah, exactly the same as that. If we address even just our fears about their behaviour, does that yeah. help? 
Yeah, definitely. Yep. There's you. a lot more we will say about children and parenting and free will and all those things in yeah. other presentations. Thanks. But it's really important to... I feel it's important to address this issue because, it, because it's something that comes up regularly with parents, this issue of how do I let them have their free will but actually teach them about love in the process. You know, it's, uh, sorry, Angie, you want to... You're in between in terms of like... As parents, we're in between teaching them about... giving them free will yeah. and teaching them about the loving consequences. It's yes. us that's in between yeah. our thing. That's right, yeah. because we haven't yet learned how to actually <laughs> exercise our own free will in a loving manner. And so we then obviously then impose those injuries upon our children so they don't know how to exercise their free will in a loving manner either. And, uh, and that's a very important issue that we all need to face. The beauty of having children is you can process through these kind of emotions that the average person will have huge difficulty through a law of attraction of actually ever accessing and yet when we have our children, they're all there just in a single moment, you know, half of those are there. And as long as we own them, we can get through lots of stuff quite rapidly. And you'll be amazed at the changes in your children when you do it. Like just absolutely amazed about what happens with them without you having to verbalise anything. The truth is that our children are much closer to a pristine condition than we ourselves are. So therefore, when we release some emotion and teach them about love, if we do both of those things, our children will understand love probably better than we do after a, f after a year or two of that. And uh, we can learn a lot from them in that process. Yeah. yeah. If we come down to Carol here. With the I just want to tell you something very quickly. I stopped at an accident um, about four months ago in Brisbane. I was the second person there. So the first person had it pretty much under control. But there was a young mother with two little kids in it. Mm -hmm. And um, the little boy was more, the bigger boy was more worried about the cat in the, in the, in the cage. The 10-month-old baby in arms was very intently looking at his mother. And all she wanted was t to get a partner who she just dropped off to work and I got him on the phone. But all the time, this 10-month-old baby was pulling her face around and kissing her on the lips every 10 seconds. Yep. Like every 10 seconds yep. while she was on the phone. And it was like... <laughs> yeah, and big indication, <laughs> big indication of what's going on for the mum. Oh. Feeling very unloved, wants, mm -hmm. wants to feel loved. And mm. the children just instantly react. And they don't even have to be speaking no. to react. And this is one way that we finish up projecting a lot of our children because, because while we, are, we, we don't own something inside of ourselves, our child, who is the most sensitive person in our environment, is actually feeling the reflection of everything I deny within myself. Mm. So, so our children, because of their, their depth of sensitivity, um, give us the biggest feedback as to what's going on for us. But unfortunately, we often interpret it, like I'm sure their mum interpreted it as a good thing, when actually, the inter if we look at it truly as it is, there was this emotion she was denying that the child felt they had to nurse, even at 10 months of age. And I felt that sitting on this meridian strip, this little baby was really the most concerned of all the people in this accident and was wearing most of the uh, trauma. Yes, that's it. right. Mm. Wearing most of the projection from, from mum as well. Yeah, that's right. Um, if we go here and then... Just over. This right up there. Just a quick question. What age do they stop reflecting? They never stop reflecting. Oh, you, you are still reflecting your parents' unhealed emotion right now. Okay, so it, it just goes on forever. And if I clear up my stuff, then my son might live in a tidier environment yeah the when i say it never yes that's very true yeah, okay. the 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 um the issue for us as adults is once we once we start realizing these truths we can change from now on so obviously as we change we can stop this process of reflecting our parents emotions by becoming conscious of our own reflections but but as a child obviously it's very difficult for them to consciously do that but as an adult, we can do that. But the truth is that while I remain unconscious of my own condition, I am continuously reflecting my parents' unhealed emotions. Right? Because you think about it, who created most of my unhealed emotions? 
and my environment, which is mostly my parents. So, so yes, um, you will find as an adult, and you have adult children, and some of you are very disappointed in your adults' ch children's behaviour, which, by the way, is a judgement, um, <laughs> which is something you need to look at from a loving perspective. But, but, but what we do is we get very disappointed in our adults' ch children's behaviour, and, and we don't realise that actually their behaviour is a complete reflection of something that I am still denying inside of myself as a parent. And, and you can test this over and over again. So it's not like you can just trust me here. You don't have to trust me here. You put this into practice emotionally. And what will happen in you is you'll notice your adult children's behaviour change when you get to one of these causal emotions. They, their behaviour will change. And, and they won't even know why half the time. Like they won't even know why, but all of a sudden something's released from them and it's an oppression from their parent that they're getting released from them. And, and they don't even know what's happening and yet all of a sudden they feel like they want to do something different than they've ever done before. And you don't even have to say the words. You don't even have to be in the same vicinity of them. You can be in the other side of the world of them and this occur. It's just a matter of... Just, and if you don't believe me, just experiment with one causal emotion. So if you know... What, look, at, look at one of the behaviours that your children uh, really bother you with. Let's say, let's say your son gets drunk the whole plaster, the whole weekend. Let's say that's happening to your son. And he just, you know, you know, goes out drinking Friday night, can't remember most of his weekend, rocks up to work Monday morning, half stoned, right? And let's say that's happening and that disturbs you. If you go into your own emotions about that and look at what the underlying causal emotions of, of what you feel about that action, you will find his behaviour will definitely change just by you dealing with something. Now, that doesn't mean they might not heal their own emotion, because they still need to do that, but, but at least the projection that coming from your unhealed state no longer is hitting them. And they are still the most sensitive person to your unhealed state. They lived with you for how long? Most of the time, 20 years, whatever, right? So they are still a, the deepest reflection of your own unhealed state. And this is something as parents we need to become very aware of. Um, something happened last night with me and my daughter. I've got my 20-year-old daughter staying with me for about six weeks before she moves to Brisbane to go to uni. Yep. And she's going on 21. And uh, about midnight, she came into my bedroom and, said, and just whispered, um, I'm, I'm just going out for a bit, Mom. And was bucketing down. And she was really dressed up. And she said, I'm just going to see my friend Tony. And I kind of looked at her in the dark, and I said, no, you're not. You're all dressed up. You're going out somewhere. Where are you going? She said, no, it's, all, it's okay. I'm just going out to see my friend Tony. Immediately, everything was coming up for me because it was dark. It was rainy. She was probably going to go out drinking. Afraid um, for her safety. Yeah, everything. Yep. And so she left, and um, instead of rolling over and going to bed, I got up, and I was pacing the floor. And for about an hour, I started processing all my stuff around her, um, and for an hour, you know, it was only an hour, like, and I felt, there, and there's still more, lots yeah. more to do. Yeah. Um, just around everything, around my um, fears and my concerns and my controls, everything. And I was on the floor for about an hour, and I managed to get up and go to bed. Yeah. And in half an hour, she's over the bed again saying, I'm back. <laughs> I, I went to this place, and I just didn't want to be there. <laughs> And exactly. I and came home. And so, so I'm going to bed now. Bye. And doesn't it make you wonder why she left in the first place then? <laughs> because, uh, and a lot of times our children do this just because of un our unhealed emotion. They don't even know why they're going to do something. Oftentimes our, even our adult children go and do something just because of something they feel from us. And then when we release it, they instantly change and stop wanting, even wanting it. They don't even want to do it anymore. It, you will find when you experiment with this as a parent, no matter what age, how remarkable it is in terms of your own work, processing work. Yeah. Thanks. If we go over here, please. Adrian, does a five-year-old um, have unhealed emotion when, like us as parents, have? If, if my child is triggering me, and I have looked at the emotion, and um, the child's behaviour does or doesn't change. Does that five-year-old have unhealed emotion or is it completely, we change everything, everything automatically shifts in that child? Um, yes, the child does have unhealed emotion. 
Um, of course there is emotion that enters the child that can't exit the child because of our previous uh, damage that we've done to the child. So of course a child of five years of age does have unhealed emotional injury. The problem that they have though is that it will automatically flow out of them when we release the blockage to that emotion inside of ourselves. So it's very rare for a child to retain a blockage inside of themselves when we if we act in love and in truth towards our child. And that's where I've used the example where when we were travelling, remember, and we were in a car with a group of people and all I did is it just, I just suggested to the parents, don't do the addictive behaviour anymore, that, you know, the parents' addictive behaviour anymore. And, when, and as soon as the parents stopped their addictive behaviour, the child started going into a tantrum. Now that's unhealed emotion in the child. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's and not necessarily tears. It could be any emotion they start to display. That's right, yeah. So this child went into a tantrum, a tantrum for an hour and a half. So that was all effect-based tantrum. It wasn't... It, it was just stuff where anger, where they, they've always been able to use anger to control mummy before, and it's always worked, right? And so they go into a tantrum, and they soon enough they're going to get mum's attention and approval through this process. Now, the mum wanted to give that, but then realise that, no, no, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stay up the front and l allow this to continue. And for an hour and a half, he yelled, screamed, threw things, uh, eventually exhausted the throwing, of course, because there was nothing around him to throw anymore. But, you know, he, he yelled, screamed, threw things. And after an hour and a half, he actually got into his grief. And that was the causal emotion, the grief about, you know, how he felt unloved as a male because of mum's projections about men that he's received from the moment he was conceived, right? So he started releasing this grief that he had, which took about 20 minutes, that's all. And when he finished crying, he turned into this ultra-loving person um, so immediately, right? So you know, a week, a, a hour and a half of terrifying emotions and then 20 minutes of a causal emotion and then the release was there and you could feel the release there. Unfortunately, because mum didn't heal her damage towards men, the next day she's still projecting anger at men, which he's now receiving as a new projection. So obviously he's now going to get angry again about the whole thing. Does that make sense? Yeah. And this is why it's very important to understand that, yes, our children do have unhealed emotion, but we need to firstly focus on ourselves as parents and when we do that we'll know how to help our child through the unhealed emotion. So if I, my child is still acting out that behaviour, I still have to look at me and not address them until I've finished looking at me? Um, no, I feel address both things concurrently. For example, gunplay, you know, continuing to play with guns, yeah, continuing okay. to want to eat meat. Okay, is so that me or him? Well, that's, that's, that's you, yeah, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's look at the gunplay, right? So he's obviously, he, he's normally a peace, peaceful person, but he loves guns, right? And he loves <laughs> shooting things and making out he's shooting things and all these other things, right? So, so there's something he's triggering in you. I think he's even told you what it is, hasn't he? He might have. He's pretty intuitive. He's I think he's already yeah, told he's you what mummy is emotion is about he when he gets upset. Yeah, he might with, have. With when he wants to kill things. Yeah, he might have. I can't remember. <laughs> you re do you remember that um, you sent me an email once of uh, you told me that he had a spirit with him. Yes. He told you, mummy, I've got yeah. a spirit with me and he liked playing with guns but when you dealt with that emotion he didn't want to play with guns anymore. Yes. You remember that? Yeah, I do. So a lot of times our children are acting out, th through some attractions with the spirit world as well, are acting out some unhealed emotion that we have. Mm. So you have a deep fear of violence towards your person. Yes. Do you not? Yes. And you know that's not yet released. Yes. That's the emotion you need to start going into. And when you start going into that emotion, he won't feel drawn to violence. Does that make sense? Yeah, and yeah. that's related to the self-attack thing, the, the attack from others as well, isn't it? It's all linked in together. That's right, because you're so afraid of being having violent attacks towards yourself and obviously you know that's related to your own childhood. And, and so you can see the relationship there. When you heal that emotion, and remember... If you think of your own childhood, this is about a man as well, isn't it? So do I really have to? <laughs> well, yes, you do have to go there at some point, right, if you want to heal the emotion. And when you heal that emotion, what will happen is that he will stop acting out that violence because um, all he's doing is triggering you with it, basically. So uh, this is a beautiful... Remember, parents, this is a beautiful thing that happens between you and your children. It, it, you can rapidly get into causal emotion this way. It's really, really good. 
And, and, and honestly, if you allow yourself to get into causal emotion this way, what will happen very rapidly is you'll work through things probably a lot more rapidly than the average person who doesn't have children around them will work through their emotions. So that's a real blessing and benefit to you in that situation. And um, we go across. Um, thank you, Jay. Um, I feel very embarrassed to start with that. Um, I've got a pile of emotions. It's uh, very, very difficult for me to talk about this um, in front of an audience. It's mm -hmm. my first time here. Mm -hmm. And I'm here with my mother. Yeah. Um, and um, my mother doesn't speak English. Mm -hmm. And this is the reverse role. I'm the child. I haven't got children. Yeah. I've never actually had the opportunity to learn all of this through my children because I decided not to have children from an early age. Yes, yep. And, and um, so I tried to get my mother to learn about her own emotions. Mm -hmm. And... Um, can, can I first address that issue itself? Yeah. Um, this is something that many of you will be tempted to do as children, hearing this information. So all of us are children, right? We've all had a parent at some point. And so the problem that we face is hearing this information as a parent, we can start seeing how we treat our own children. But hearing this information as a child, we start reflecting upon a lot of things, right? And we start going down the track of going, hmm, mm, yeah, my parents created a lot of emotion in me then. Because that's true, is it not? So my parents create a lot of emotion in me then. Oh, this means that now I can blame or I can actually get my parents to change and it will be easier for me, right, once I can get them to do something. And what, what I want to do is address this as a projection. So here's, here's myself. Here's my mother, right? So that's mum, me. When I project at somebody else that they must or even I want them to learn something, I am in that instant being unloving because they have free will. They are allowed to not learn anything that I'm learning. They are allowed to never admit to you that they've ever done any damage to you. Does that make sense? They are allowed, because of their, it's, not, it's not the wisest thing, by the way, to do, but they are allowed to do it because they have free will and they are allowed, from God's perspective, to exercise this free will in a, the most unloving manner they choose to, if that's what they want. And in that process, there will be consequences on their own soul. Does that make sense? Now, when I go into this, I would really like my mum, my dad to deal with this emotion, I know if they dealt with that it would be so much easier for me. And all that is true, the truth is that if my mum deals with an emotion about her condescension towards men, I will certainly find it easier to work through how I feel that I've been treated condescendingly by my mother. Does that make sense? It will certainly make it easier. But my desire for her to do that is actually an unloving projection in itself. And what she does is she will feel that as a demand upon her free will. Now, how does anyone react to demands? Most people react to demands in a very resistive way, do they not? Right? So immediately we'll find when we have this must or want of our parent to deal with something, we are projecting a demand at them, which, by the way, comes from our anger right, which actually comes from our fear that we're not going to be able to clear their grief without their assistance. So there's a lot of unhealed emotion in this process. And, and this demand is then projected at them, unloving. And of course this person who created, let's look at it, most of our emotion, uh, a lot of our unhealed emotion, this person is going to go into deep resistance probably towards us as a result. So... So what we've got to do if we're the child and even a grown child I'm talking about here is we have to start looking at the fact that every time I demand something of someone else I am just projecting my anger at them. That's all I'm doing, really. And I need to go deeper now into what I'm afraid of. Why am I demanding 
or wanting my parent to heal the emotion. And usually when you get down to it, you know it's, it's this emotion that many of us have, that it's unfair for me to have to do it when they created it in me. Right? That's the, often the underlying feeling we have. It's unfair. This is not fair. And love, by the way, I must say, isn't fair. It's not about justice. Love isn't about justice. Love is about unconditional love. And often it doesn't feel... And initially, as you're working your way through these emotions, often it doesn't feel very fair. When you get into a state of bliss with God, you'll realise how fair it is because you're the only one in the state of bliss with God in your family and everyone else is still in their mess, right? And you'll feel the fair then. But until then, often we have a lot of unhealed emotion and we start projecting this anger through demands at the parents so that we can avoid the process ourselves. It's actually quite a selfish demand that we can place on our parent. Because our parent, sure, was the creator and from their emotional damage, obviously God's already addressed the fact through their soul condition of what damage they've created to, our, to us as a child. And they will have to work through all of that at some point in the future, whether it be now on earth or in the spirit world. At some point, God's laws will demand that of them, right? But when I demand that of them, when I say God's laws demands it of them, when they have free will to take that process to 10,000 years or 100,000 years long. God doesn't have a time frame with it that we often have. You know, what we often want is, mum deals with this this week, then I can get over it, <laughs> right? And what we've got to do is forget that because what we're actually doing is projecting an angry demand upon mum and an expectation that she deals with this in that time frame. And in the process of that, I am actually being unloving in that moment. So I've got to start allowing myself to see that. Does that make sense? I, I, it does, um, and I am aware of that. That yeah. was the first point, and I appreciate you stopping me there. Yeah, because I want to stop you again, actually, because there's something else I want to say about your particular situation, yeah. and that is um, there is a strong desire for you to look after your mum. I have to, yeah, you go on and then I'll continue because there's much more to go on. To. Yes. So let's look at this strong desire to look after your mum. Where does that come from? Well, um, it comes because um, there, it comes from, a, from the unloving. I know it's unloved, being unloved and getting, getting, um, getting some kind of attention through that, looking after it. Awesome. So yeah. it's it's um, I've been working through that, and I am quite aware of all the feelings That's good. behind that. That's good. However, my my liking and wanting is because I, and this is what is very embarrassing. It's like I have to look after my mother is very dependent, and she doesn't have physically where to live, or any much much money um, to support herself. Yeah. And. Um, so uh, I want to look after myself. Mm -hmm. I actually left Argentina 25 years ago and, um, and my, my family was there. And so that was my thing of looking after myself then. And I had done a lot of work um, on the natural path until I broke yep. a, an arm two months ago and heard about you. Yeah. Anyway, um, so... Once I found this loving path, I thought this is much, much better. Yeah. And um, I, I know I was in a, in a reasonably good state before that, and now I've got to work through this again. Yeah. But with a good foundation, I would say, because I'm aware of all these emotions anyway. Now that I'm doing, I, I do them from a different perspective and much more, yeah, from the God, per God divine love perspective. So I'm very happy with that. Yeah. But the thing is that um, because of the actual situation with her, um, I can't just say, well, our relationship, it's not working. We're hurting each other here. I don't have to do this. I, I don't like to demand anything from you. I'm aware that that demand is not good and I'm not allowing her the free will. Yeah. But... Uh, on the other hand, or at the same time, I can't 
kick her out of my place. And she doesn't know the language. She doesn't know where to go. Can so I ask you a direct it's question, such though? A big thing. Is your mother treating you unlovingly when she's living with you? Um, I think she is not, not, not on the surface because she looks like a really loving person. Yeah. And that is, <laughs> that is a self-reception. I feel <laughs> that she's been doing this for her life. And it's horrible for me to say this in front of everybody about yeah. my mother, the one that I want to help. R remember here, <laughs> remember here, we're not trying to judge a person. We're, what, we're, what I've asked you specifically is how you feel, which doesn't even necessarily mean that how you feel is true. Does that make sense? In the sense of God's truth, it yeah. is definitely how you feel. So let's yeah. look at how you feel. Do you feel that you're being treated lovingly? In some areas I have, but not in everything. Right. And um, when you try to address the areas that you're not being treated lovingly, yeah. what happens? Um, this is an action. She's looking after me. <laughs> yeah. It's very hard to be not loving or not wanting to help someone that is always trying to help you in a way or another way. So anyway, going back to the question. Yeah. If you can just hold the mic a bit more direct so I can yeah. hear you clearly. Yep. Yeah. It, it, one of the things, that, one of the emotions that is unhealed inside of you is you're, you're yet to cut the umbilical cord emotionally between yourself and your mother. Yes. And the justification for it remaining is that, oh, my mum is loving me. That's the justification. Um, so at the moment uh, you're not living your own life, are you? No. No, you're not living the life you want. I don't even know what is the life I want Okay. Anymore. I used to. Yeah, well that, that's one issue obviously, time. isn't it? Yeah. So we need to know what kind of life is that we want So before we leave the one we're in probably. Yeah. But the issue that you're facing at the moment is you're not doing what you desire and your desire is being suppressed through the relationship. It seems to me that what Can you I'm hold it directly so I can hear yeah. you? Yeah. It seems to me that my desire is helper. It's a deep and desire. Ah, this is your hook. This is your addiction. That's what I yep. it seems to me. So yep. I don't Definitely. that's why I said I don't know what the desire is anymore. Because you have actually lived your life now based on your mum's desires. Yeah. Does that make sense? So so now, if I was a loving parent I wouldn't want you to live your life based on my desires, exactly. no matter how ill I was yep. and no matter how much I didn't know the language and no matter how much I didn't yep. do anything else, I would not want you yep. to live your life through me and my demands. And this is what I said to her many times and in different ways and, and it seems like a demand. And what's the response? But there is no way. No. No, that's what you think it is. It's your, it's your reason. It's not mine. Um, okay. And then she goes into this her self, self deception kind of thing. You know, she's got her own story about it. Yeah. And it's immaterial what her story is about it. Yeah. The issue that you face is you, you are totally me, hooked how, into her story. Say? Sorry. Yeah. You are totally hooked into her story. Yeah. And that's what you've got to break away from. Yeah. And how are you going to do that? Well, that's my question because of the physical, the practicalities of it all. Well, how you are you going to do that? Firstly, is learning how to love you. You need to love you. At the moment, what you're doing is everything for mum because you want mum to love you. Well, uh, I would like her to be able to stand on her own two feet. So I didn't have to do it anymore. That's, the re that's what I feel. I really feel It's that. immaterial. Let's, let's stop. See, uh, uh, see, most of us get very stuck on the practicalities. Do you know what I mean by that? We say, oh, but mum's ill or mum's this or mum's had this operation or mum's old or, or dad's sick and he's got a bad heart and, da -da 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 and off we go. Not realising that every single one of those things we've just said is their own law of attraction from their own life yeah. for which they are fully responsible. Does that yeah. make sense? So what we finish up doing is we explain to ourselves our own addictive behaviour because what we want is actually to avoid the fact that we have the addiction. We have the addiction. 
I am addicted to earning mum's love. You are addicted to earning mum's love. And while you have this addiction, you will treat yourself always unlovingly in preference to whatever your mum says or does. And, and while you ma maintain this addiction, you will not address the underlying emotion, which is the fact that you don't actually feel loved by your mum at all. You actually feel very oppressed by your mother. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And you don't want to fully process through that emotionally and actually break the oppression. You see, to break the oppression probably means that for a while you're going to have to live in separate places. Well, that's it. And that's, then what that's happens what I mean. oh, well, is your guilt kicks in and your addiction kicks in to being perceived as if you're a good daughter and straight away you then go into back, back into being unloving towards yourself. Yep. And at some point you've got to stop that addictive behaviour and that's your choice, yep. not your I mum's. I gave her a week. No, no, <laughs> you're not giving her a week. You need to do something for you, not her. Well, we have to split up. We have to live in two separate places, So like do you it. Said. Create yeah. it right now. Don't give her a week. <laughs> well, we have to go back to. I can't just leave her here. Yeah, but behind. you know, obviously you're going <laughs> you know, to home. We right? come obviously from you go near home. Cobb's Harbour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Obviously you go home, and you don't give it a week or an hour from that time. You say, yeah. right now we are now reorganising our life. Yeah. Because I am living my life through your, you, and I'm addicted to trying to get your love that I feel I'm not getting. I'm getting oppressed instead. Yeah. And what I need to do is address my addiction. You, this is what I'm saying. Mum address her addiction, because she has one too, by the way, but yeah. you address your addiction. Do you follow me? Yeah. If, if you address your addiction, you can heal this, and you may at even some point be able to live together again in a totally different relationship. Yeah. But if you don't deal with this addiction that you have towards being wanting her love, wanting her love, wanting her love, which is actually a demand upon her, yeah. right, that she is unwilling yeah. to respond to in the way yeah. that you want to, yeah. right, but that is a demand upon her, and, and that is an unloving demand upon her, but what we're often willing to do is we don't want to be perceived by other people that we're being a bad daughter now. We don't want to be perceived that, you know, that, you know, I've abandoned my own mother and she's in such a hard place. Yeah. And then society says, oh, you're a mongrel of a person because you've <laughs> abandoned your mother. And, and, you know, and all those. We don't want to feel all those emotions. Yeah. And so what we do is we hook back into the relationship. Yeah. And all we're doing is avoiding our own emotion. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So if you can, uh, if you can see that, yeah. then you will see and know what to do, right? Okay. Without anybody having to tell you what to do, you will know what to do because okay. at some point somebody has to love you and if you don't start loving you, no one else is going to start loving you before you love you. Okay. Very rare, by the way. This is something to bear in mind. It is very rare for anyone to love you before you start loving yourself. Yes. Because yeah. where did you learn how to not love you from? From your environment. Yeah. So how, it's going to require one of those people changing before you start loving you. Like, so where did you learn to not love yourself from? From mum. Yep. Right? So is she able to teach you how to love yourself? No. Of course she can't. Does that make sense? Yep. Unless she goes through lots of her own emotions and works her way through those emotions, she has no way. Now, what yep. you're trying to do is you're trying to make her go through those emotions so you yep. don't, so you can feel loved. Yeah. And it's not going to work that way for you. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Can we go over to Natalie? Hi, AJ. Um, I've been just scratching on the surface of some anger with my mum, mm -hmm. and I don't want to address it with her yet. But what my question is. Once I've worked through that anger and I can have a conversation with her without projecting any blame or demands of her feeling or emotions, yep. am I allowed to tell her the truth ah. about how she's made <laughs> me feel? You won't even feel like you need to. Okay. That's the irony. Okay. Right. But what's actually happening, firstly, if you're in a state of anger with your mum, there's only two reasons for anger. There's two, two underlying things of anger inside of you. One is that you're denying a deeper emotion. 
Number two is you actually have some childhood rage with your mum to deal with. So you've either got one or the two. Is it an adult anger with your mother that you're feeling or is it just a little child tantrum type emotion that you're feeling with it's your mum? a bit of both there. Okay, so the little child tantrum emotion is going to need to be experienced and expressed and the way that you experience and express that is by getting out the punching bag or the pillows or whatever and getting a tennis rack or whatever else works for you, even the thing that Mary showed you the other day, shaking your body and all those things, whatever works for you and express that that right now owning it yourself. Not towards her, but owning it yourself. Now, as you express that like a childhood tantrum or rage, you will release that. The second part of the anger is the most damaging, and that is this adult place, the adult anger or resentment that we project towards our parents for what we know they did towards us. Right? Now, this adult place is an avoidance of this fear, which is an avoidance of our own grief. And every time we want to tell our parents something about something they did, all we're doing is avoiding our own fear and our own grief. Okay. Right? Now, God's laws has already dealt with our parent. The instant they created and suppressed and harmed our free will was the instant they as all received the damage. That makes me feel so good. <laughs> That's the problem. It doesn't make me feel good to say that. But it's the truth, yep. but the fact that it makes you feel good is an expression of your rage. Yep. Does that make sense? Yep. If it makes you feel good that somebody is suffering, then I'm the one being unloving. If, I, if, if I'm feeling good that you're suffering, I'm unloving. Yep. And this is the thing you need to bear in mind, is that if you're in this state where it makes you feel good, own it, be honest about it, that's awesome. But understand that's coming from this grief that you don't want to have to be forced into accessing. That's what it's all about. You don't want to get here. I want to avoid here. I want someone else to take responsibility for it. It feels too overwhelming, too powerful, too much for me to experience myself. And so what do I do? I then are af so I'm so afraid of it that I want to instead stay in a rage, in a hatred, resentment towards the person who created it. Okay. Right? And that is a very damaging place to remain. And by the way, there's lots of spirits here who are in that place. It's a very damaging place to remain. Because if you remain in that place, you can stay in that place of blame for thousands of years okay. right? without releasing. And your parent could be in the celestial heavens having released all the reasons why they did all of that and you could still be festering on it for another thousand years if you hold on to it like this. So while I'm feeling the need to tell truth, I'm actually feeling angry. Well, you, you know you're feeling angry. Yeah. <laughs> so the fact is the truth is not coming from a loving place. It's coming from a place of desiring to blame, hurt okay. and damage the person. So is it loving to say it? No. <laughs> Obviously not because my motive would be to punish her, to, make, to harm her and everything. What I need to do is get into it, the emotion of it, go into your rage and anger. That's fine. Go and feel that. But, but understand that it's only happening because you're afraid of this grief. Where does forgiveness come into it? When you release the grief, you'll forgive your mum. Okay. When you release the grief, you, you will have to get to the grief to forgive. Okay. When you release the grief, your mum will, f you, ironically, your mum will feel forgiven. Ironically, what happens after that point often is the person, it kicks the person into repentance. Like, so the person then goes through a process of repentance on their own back after that many times. So I've seen that happen thousands, millions and millions of times obviously over my life where people have got into their causal grief, felt the feeling or emotion of forgiveness and that's automatically then triggered the parent into going through the process of repentance. Okay. Right? But the parent may not do that. They, they may spend another thousand years in a process of denial. Right? You don't want to hang up your entire life and your entire feelings of bliss on the fact that you're going to wait for your parent to do that. Mm. Remember... And this is something I want to discuss tomorrow night. Your parents were a large part of the creation of the emotion within you. Does that make sense? Yes. So that being the case, they are going to be the most resistive to you dealing with those emotions. Yep. That Automatically. Makes, that makes perfect sense. They are going to be the most resistive. They are the ones who have almost a mirror of your own emotional injuries. So they are going to be the most resistive to the person to, to you working your way through them. And and understandably so, right? And and so unless those parents are really on the divine love path, really owning everything, that's wonderful if they are, but for the majority of us that it's not the case. We hear the truth before them often oftentimes. And and it's wonderful if they are in that place, but if they're not, 
I am going to have to start getting deeper than this anger and rage and resentment and down into my fear and then down into the underlying feelings I have about myself that I'm actually trying to avoid through this rage. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep, totally. Yeah. So while a lot of times it feels very justifiable to be angry because we feel like it's justice, you know, they did this damage to me, I have all this stuff in me now that AJ is telling me I have to release if I want to be at one with God. How unfair is that? Now I want to go ahead and blame and project all this anger and rage. You created all this. If you didn't deal with your stuffed up life, if you had dealt with your stuffed up life, we often say, I wouldn't have all these emotions. And then we go into this real place of resistance and openness. And you know what? Even if they deal with their stuffed up life ahead of us, it will make no difference now, unfortunately, to you in the sense that you will still have the emotions that are in you unreleased until you decide to release them. That's the unfortunate byproduct of breaking God's laws. And that is that in the end, every single person finishes up with this damage that they need to take personal responsibility for. And when you think about it, though, it's actually right to take responsibility for that. Only you can hold on to these emotions and only you can experience them and release them. No one else can do that for you. And at some point we need to get to that place of full personal responsibility. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. Allow yourself to get to that place. Thank you. Right. Yeah. If we go right up the back, thanks. Um, what about a teaching that says that a child goes through a stage of development and that stage is... Um, it's right to make demands? Um, a person who's in a state of love never makes demands. So, but, but unfortunately, um, a lot of the childhood teachings that are on the planet today are all based upon human behavioural analysis based on emotions that are unhealed. So what we do when we analyse a lot of behaviour nowadays on Earth is we get an entire unhealed error-based system and then what we do is try to explain it to ourselves. Right? And so what we do then is we go through lots of experiments and other things, you know, getting groups of people and explaining behavioural systems to ourselves that are all based on errors. The premise of like what love is compared to what it really is is distorted. And so we finish up having all of these justifications, you know, right down to men are from Mars, women are from Venus type things right the way through to how to bring up a child using behavioural therapy. And, and what, what the problem is, is that all of it is based upon some very unsound foundations. And the unsound foundation is that our child is not reflecting our own emotion. Like we believe our child is not reflecting our own emotion. We believe they have emotions that are without us, right? Initially, that's what we believe. So we believe they have their own personality, they have their own, and we believe that none of what they're experiencing has anything to do with us. And it begins with the inaccurate premise of that. And then as soon as we begin with that premise, we start analysing it and then we start putting it into papers or books or whatever, and then we start teaching it and then everyone starts believing it, but we're all just trying to satisfy ourselves as to why the error occurred in the first place. If we can go backwards and go right back and say, all right, let's assume that everything we do as parents at this point in time is often based on huge unloving emotions that we've received from our environment and our projection from our parent, family and so forth. Let's assume that for the moment and let's experiment with this. Let's just throw all that out for a moment and start on this basis of free will and love Let's just and truth, those, those three things. Let's base now all of our interactions on that. When you start doing that emotionally, not intellectually, but emotionally, so it has to come from your emotion, it has to be real, when you start doing that, every one of your child's behaviour will automatically change. And you, it'll happen right from the time of before they're even born. You will feel the changes in the womb when you do this. But once they're born, what happens is that, is that you know, they might be crying and if you deal with your emotion, right, you will work through what the issue is for you as to why they're crying. And after a while, you'll find your babies can actually communicate to you when they're hungry, when they've got to go to the toilet, everything. Absolutely everything. Now, some people I know now are experimenting with this in terms of, uh, I forget what they, call, what they call it now, 
but it's about being sensitive to the child's fully full physiological feelings and, and, and also emotions. And when you're sensitive in that way, you can actually toilet train the child at one month old, right? And you can actually communicate with your child as to when they are feeling like they need to be fed. And they won't have to get to a point where they're screaming for a meal because you're feeling already when they're hungry. Does that make sense? And you will automatically feed them at that point because you love them, right? You, you will feel when every single unhealed emotion inside of you affects them and you'll deal with that emotion and you'll notice the effect on the child. Now, when you experiment with that, and nobody on the planet at this point really has experimented with that fully, you'll find that how we view children and how we view children with behavioural therapy and cognitive therapy and all these other things that we do to try to modify behaviour has all, is all just based on theories that are based on errors. And once we remove all of that, you'll find that everything will be totally different on this planet with regard to how we bring up children. But it needs a group of people to say, all right, let's think out of the box here a bit and let's start thinking this other way and let's try experimenting. Like, let's scientifically experiment with this premise and see how it goes. And that's really, you know, something that's open to all of us here is that when we have our children, we can start experimenting. When there's a group of us that understand what's going on, we'll be able to educate others about it. And when the other, other people get educated about it, they'll then be able to do some experiments. And before you know it, it will be determined fully what's really going on. And that is that our child's behaviour is the complete reflection of our own healed and unhealed emotion. Now, their personality is not the same as that. They will be very different in the way they express that emotion and their personality and develop their personality and their gifts and their different other attributes that they have is very different. But their actual negative responses and our own panic will all subside once we understand what's truly going on with our children. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I can go. Um, I just read half of Toxic Parents yesterday, yep. so feeling a lot from that. Yep. Um, but one of the big things that was triggered for me was my sister has three children and is very um, verbally abusive, triggers me a lot, mm -hmm. I think, to do with my own childhood. Mm -hmm. um, and there, And there's also, like... I know of some physical violence towards them as well. Yeah. And I, I don't know what to do about that. Yeah. Um, so there's three under the age of 13. Yeah. And her 13-year-old told me recently that um, she slapped him across the face and how that was his fault. Yeah. And um, I've tried to talk to her before and she said, you don't understand, you don't have children. Yeah. And I said, well, I was one. And I know how it feels. So, mm. um, and I am really confused about what my responsibility is in terms of ensuring they're in a loving environment. Yep. Or this question was asked yesterday, actually. Okay, earlier. I wasn't here. Yeah, and um, and and the issue um, that we face is you are right. You've been a child, so you know how it feels to be treated badly as a child. But there is a law of attraction going on here for you. This is a direct reflection of what happened in your own childhood towards you, which is one of the reasons why it's affecting you so strongly. Now, when it affects us strongly, the, the problem is, is that we obviously still have unhealed emotion within ourselves, firstly, which then causes us to project judgment at the perpetrator. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. So what your sister is feeling from you is a heap of judgment. Yeah. Right? Now, that judgment, firstly, really needs to dissipate before you'll be able to help her. The only way the judgment is going to dissipate is for you to feel the childhood causal emotions that are being triggered by the events. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what firstly we need to do is get into this state of feeling our own childhood and what's occurred in our own childhood that this, these events are triggering. That's number one. So when you, you can do that on one issue and now you can help her on that issue. Okay. You can do it on a second issue and now you can help her on the second issue. Yep. It doesn't have to be like you deal with it all and now you can help her. <laughs> it's not like that at all. It's every issue you deal with that causes you to judge her about her actions. If Once you deal with it and release it, then you'll be in a state where you're in a state of love with her as well as with her children. Yep. 
Yeah. Now, when you're in a state of love towards both parties, the abuser, or, or if we could call it that, and the abusee, the person who's being abused, and you're in a state of love towards both, now you're in a state where you can help the situation in the most to, to the largest degree. And so in that place, you would never avoid truth. You would never avoid the truth of what is going on. So you wouldn't say, oh, yeah, they're getting abused, but they're her children, or they're getting belted around, but they're her children, and I can't do anything about it. So you would never do that. Because a state of love doesn't avoid confrontation. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. So what we need to do is allow ourselves, firstly, to work through the emotional reasons why we judge. That prevents us from judging. That then prevents them from feeling the feelings of judgment. Then we need to work through the emotions about why we are not confronting the issue in truth. And then we go ahead and just confront the issue in truth and see where the chips fall. Yeah. Now, if the chips fall, she, your sister hates your gust for the rest of your life, but you've actually prevented the abuse of three children, mm -hmm. then I think that's a really great place. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and, and my feelings are I would do that if, if that was the result. To give you an example, in my own life, I had one of my sons uh, had a girlfriend, and she um, um, she was, uh, I think, well, Tristan, she would have been fourteen probably at the time, sixteen at the time uh, that I met her. Anyway, so her mother and herself would get into fist fights, right, where they'd punch each other up. And uh, one time this happened, and she left home. The girl left home and had nowhere to live. And I said she could live with me, right? And, uh, and so she came and lived with... When I say live with me, that we're, my two boys were living with me as well, so there was three of us now in the house. And, and she lived with me for a month, right? Now, during that month, her mother rang every day abusing me, mm. right? Yeah. And I was perfectly happy with that situation because it gave me an opportunity to talk to her mother about her behaviour. And, and part of the discussion with her mum about this behaviour, I said, well, you know, she's going to stay here for as long as she wants to stay. Um, when she wants to leave, I'm sure she'll leave, right? Yeah. But I'm not, sending, I'm not sending her back home to you while you're fist fighting with her, mm -hmm. right? Whatever you're doing and whatever reason you have for this, it's not loving and I can't agree to it. Mm -hmm. And I'm certainly not going to push a child back into that environment, right? Now, she, of course, had all this judgment at me. You were meddling in my family, you're da -da -da, and off, off she went, right? And while all of those things might have been true, I don't know. I didn't feel I was meddling. All I was doing was trying to prevent a, a, a person from being hit around, right? In the end, I said to her, why, why do you feel this way towards your daughter? And she said, ever since she was born, she was a bitch. Mm -hmm. That was her, that's mm -hmm. her words. And, and when I felt those emotions, like, oh, you know, it's pretty upsetting to hear that from a child, that the, 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 you've got a baby in your arms and you feel this girl is a bitch from the moment she's born. Mm. Right? That's a pretty negative projection. No wonder the daughter wants to have a fist fight with her, right? Yeah. Because of that projection from her life. And I said, well, that just demonstrates, doesn't it, like some very, very big problems that you have mm. as a mother. And she said, you know, of course she then went off and said, oh, you know, you calling me a terrible mother, rah, 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 which a lot of mothers obviously are very sensitive about. But the truth is she was being a bad mother because she felt her daughter and projected her daughter that she was a bitch from the moment she was born. Yeah. Right? Now, now, I had to feel my emotions through that entire process. Like, even as to why I wanted to come to the rescue of this girl. Do you know what I mean? I had to work my way through those emotions and allow myself to feel it. But at some point, I also had to act in harmony with love and truth, right? And in the process of acting in harmony with love and truth, had to take some action to prevent an abusive situation. But if I did that with judgment, so I still don't feel judgment towards the mother. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. I can tell her that she is an unloving mother and has treated her daughter unlovingly from the moment she was born, but still I can feel my, her mum's emotion too. And her mum was treated unloving really from the moment she was born. Yeah. And it's a multi-generational problem. And I can have compassion for that, but still state the truth. And when you get to that state, that's when you can help the most. You don't always have a result, but at least you can help the most. One thing I noticed uh, when I was reading yesterday is there's a lot of sort of... I think it's a combination of confusion and denial as 
I don't actually know why I feel as totally fucked up as I do because yep. I can't actually – I don't actually feel like I even know what happened yep. in my life. Like, so reading the book has just created like a whirlwind of – I don't even know what. For you. Like yeah. So the key is to allow those emotions to become present. Now, obviously, some negative things have occurred. Otherwise, you wouldn't feel what you feel. Mm. All right. The problem that we have is our parents. If we go to our parents and say, "I start asking questions. Uh, Did this happen? No. Did that happen? No. Did that happen? No. <laughs> You're just all in your imagination, right? And and our parents, of course, are not going to corroborate any of our emotional injury because who created our emotional injuries? Mostly, it was our environment and mostly our parents, right? Mm. So of course, they're not going to corroborate our emotional injury. What you need to start doing is learning to trust yourself about your own emotional injury, not what anyone else says to you. Trust yourself and your law of attraction. Okay. So here you, you have a sister violently treating her children badly and you are reacting. Mm. That's your law of attraction. Okay. So there's something in that from your childhood. The key is just to go into the situation with your sister and, their and her children and let yourself put yourself in the position of these children mm. and feel the emotions as if they're yours because there are a lot of your emotions in this. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. And when you do that, you will start connecting with some memories that you've shut down for a lot of your life that you haven't wanted to face mm. about your own childhood and you'll release the rest of it. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. So your law of attraction and the fact that you have an emotional response to what's going on in your law of attraction demonstrates that there is something here for you okay. emotionally. And the Toxic Parents book is great to read, by the way. If any of you haven't read it, my suggestion is to give it a read. The reason why is it starts opening up you up to what is toxic or abusive behaviour yeah. in yeah. terms of it and what it creates in the child. And you, unfortunately, if you're a parent, you'll recognise your own actions a lot of times, but also if you're a child, you'll recognise a lot of things too. Okay. Does that make sense? Thank you very much. No worries. Can I go right out the back? touched on this briefly mm -hmm. and I'd like to visit it, please. Um, my two sons, 27, 30, one lives in Perth, one lives in Cairns. Yep. They had organised to get together for a holiday and, um, and I shared with them, look, hey, I'd love to come and join you after you've had some time together yep. to be with you. Yep. I went and um, there was a very ugly scene where as a result of the cocktail of much booze and dope, yeah. my older son actually assaulted my younger son and I didn't actually know that at the time. Um, and my heart, and I, I saw my older son with an entity in him and it was, and my heart just closed. Mm -hmm. um, a week later I did lots and lots of processing for myself, what are my addictions, what's in this for me, what's my pain around this yeah. and um, I finally got to see him a week later and I, I said, look, I just have to share with you, I don't know how to be with you. My heart just closed mm. and I'm getting another piece to this today, to listening, just looking at, well, what was my law of attraction here? I so wanted to be with them and have a sense of feeling of belonging and that did not happen. Mm. How do you feel about men? And let's me, let me re-ask the question. How do you feel about your dad? What was your dad like? My dad was actually my favourite parent, but the one I think who actually abused me. So you feel he may have uh, physically or sexually, sexually abused you? Sexually abused. Okay. So here's your dad. And this is all... What's going on between your sons, by the way, is all about your relationship with your dad. I get that. All right. <laughs> so, so what you're looking from for a man from a man is a togetherness and a closeness and feeling of rapport. Now, does that make sense? Now, that is a projection that occurs from you to your sons, both of them. Does that make sense? If they feel that as a demand. All right. So the key is firstly to go about healing your relationship with your dad, because everything everything that's going on with the sons is about this relationship with your dad. Now, interesting how you say your dad was your favourite parent, but he, you feel he abused you. I, I'm, I think so, but I'm not certain right. whether did, it was him or his father. Did he ever act father. violently towards you? No. 
So how did he act? My you? mother was the one who used to hit me. Okay, so you've got, so you've got your mum, your mum, who acts violently. Um, when you say, uh, well, I can remember witnessing my father thumping his fist on the dinner table. Yeah. That was enough, probably. Yeah. Mm. So, so he didn't act violently towards you specifically. No. Taking out of the account that if you're sexually abused, that is a violent act. In Absolutely. Itself, right? Yeah. All right. So, so there's your dad, and there's your mum, and your mum's been quite violent towards you. Can you see inside of you? There's a number of emotions. Firstly, about violence. All right. What do you feel personally about violence? I'm scared a bit. Terrified. That's one of my fears of being physically hurt. Yes. Yeah. So you're terrified of personal violence towards yourself. That had to have come from somewhere. Can you see that? It's got to have come from somewhere. It can't just automatically appear in a child. There has to be a reason for it. And you see a lot of times what we, what we do um, with our law of attraction and with our emotions, and this is something to bear in mind for all of you, is we often skip over what our fears are, thinking, oh, it's not happened in my life, so I don't understand why I've got it, so I just try to ignore it. Does that make sense? That's what we try to do generally. But there must be something that's happened for you to have such a terrified feeling about violence. You've got such a terrified feeling about violence, when you see one person do it to another, you can no longer connect emotionally to that person. I didn't see that happening. I found out months later that that had happened. Yeah, but same yeah. thing. You, 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 yeah. you feel that straight away, right? Now, um, you're correct in that your son, obviously the cocktail they were drinking attracts lots of spirits. Before you know it, there's unhealed emotion between the, the, between the siblings. Still is. And still is, of course. And then, of course, this just exacerbates the unhealed emotion because it doesn't get dealt with by having drink and alcohol and then having spirit overcloak you and cause you to do different things. The issue, though, that you can address is the issue with the unhealed emotions about violence and about that as the perpetrator. And because you suspect sexual violence towards yourself but you can't put your finger on it, is probably the best way to put it, isn't it, at this point, um, you then don't trust the emotions that come up as a result of the thought. Do you understand what I mean by that? No. Can you what often happens is that, uh, for instance, we have a suspicion many times that something happened to us as a child. But because we go along to our parents and we ask them and they say, no, that never happened. And then because we, um, we then don't trust ourselves and we go down the track of saying, all right, well, this, I don't know where this feeling come from. Let's just dismiss it for another year. And then the next year it comes up and it comes up again and we go along and we ask some more details maybe of this time of aunt, aunts and uncles and, you know, try to get more details. And they say, no, I can't remember anything like that. So then we dismiss it again for a few more years and then and the only reason why we're not feeling the emotion is because we're being told from our environment that it never happened I never confront and I've done lots of work on this history yep. um, what is interesting is that I have an abhorrence of, of drink drunkenness in men my dad was not a drinker okay so whoever did hurt you whoever did create this fear of violence in you was obviously a drinker. Mm. That's your law of attraction, right? You see, we don't trust our law of attraction. See, that's the problem. We start by not trusting our law of attraction and then we think that uh, something never happened when it probably did, but we just blocked it out from our memory because, and our law of attraction is telling us the truth every day. Every day our law of attraction is telling us the truth. So if you feel afraid of spirit-influenced drunkards, which is very much the case with mm -hmm. yourself, then there's something about a spirit-influenced drunkard that's affected your life mm -hmm. in the past that you at the moment are not allowing yourself to remember because of the terrifying event. Does that make sense? Yes. And all you need to do is allow yourself to acknowledge that. Just even acknowledging that will start bringing to you the truth of the issue. Right? So this is how you can access unhealed and unremembered, emotion, uh, unremembered in, um, things in mm. your life. All you need to do is start acknowledging the law of attraction and what it's bringing you as an evidence that something happened to you in the past. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I, I know something did. Yeah. My dad's brother um, was murdered some years ago and yeah. when I heard the news, something inside me went good. And I didn't know my history at that time. So it's another law of attraction event. Mm. So, uncle? 
something going on there with your uncle. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And now if you start piecing together these mm -hmm. law of attraction events, and you don't have to know the truth at this point. Mm -hmm. All you need to do is allow the emotional experience of this. The emotional experience is I've had, I've had a law of attraction event where one son has harmed the other, huge amounts of violence. I've closed down emotionally towards that man, right? Towards, so this is, this is a reflection of something that's happened before in your life. You, you following me? And if you allow yourself to dis go through this process of discovery, what will happen is you will link it back and eventually you will discover what actually did occur. So rather than me say what did occur, it's far better for you to discover it through trusting this process that's going on with you. Does that, you, you understand? Yes. And so, so the best thing to do at this point is to actually, is actually now allow this law of attraction events to, to come to your recollection, all right, there must have been this event happened, I've been, you know, so you think of your sexual life and you know that related to that there's been a lot of not very nice things happen, right? And you know that they have to be also related to some law of attraction stuff from your childhood. So you put that together with the fact of this violence, with the fact of a person who drinks, with the fact of a person who's spirit influenced, and you start adding all these, put th these things together and you will start being able to feel firstly the terror you feel, then some of the other deeper emotions that you feel about a man in this state harming you and feeling your own emotions about it. And you don't even need to know at this point what happened to do that. The irony is, is if you allow the process to complete, you will eventually know exactly what happened with a few little provisos in that if the age of it happening to you was quite young, was. you would have been taken out of body by your spirit guides at times. I used and to escape through the back of my neck. Yes, you have a... And almost every person who's experienced childhood abuse that's violent has done that. And almost every spirit uh, who's helping you as a guide or a guardian will assist a child to do that so they don't have to fully experience what went on at the time. And these are all events that you need to piece together. Does that make sense? And allow yourself to piece them all together. This is all evidence for you that there is still the unhealed emotion there inside that needs to be released. Now, when you go through that process, you'll come out the other end and you'll have a fairly good idea of what happened to you. Because you went out of body, you won't always have a perfect idea because the moments you were out of body, you obviously won't easily remember or remember at all, in fact. But when you're in your body, you'll remember the start of the events, the aftermath of the events that occurred. Does that make sense? Mm, and, and I have <coughs> quite a lot of that already in place. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, so my suggestion is to continue with that and then just see that this thing going on with your sons is actually a complete reflection of violence that have been perpetrated towards you and fear of that. Now, your son's emotions, obviously, there's a lot of other things at play. There's stuff with you and there's stuff with their dad and there's stuff with, you know, between each other as a result of the stuff with you and with their dad. And that's all something that you... that. There's not much you can do about now mm. aside from deal with all of the unhealed emotions inside of you that caused the stuff with you and their dad. Does that make sense? That was the triggering things. Are separate dads, are they, or the same dad? Sorry, same dad. Same dad, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so, so this will enable you then to work your way through your emotions. And as you do, your sons will feel more love from their mother as, a, as an automatic result because... This feeling inside of you of fear about men and uh, it covers a lot of grief and some anger about men and so forth. And two, two men are getting this from you. Two, uh, does that make sense? And they've got it from you ever since they were born, right? And what will happen is as you release these emotions, these men will start feeling a feeling of love from you rather than just, an, just what you, know, you try to demonstrate to them. Not, they won't feel that as much as the feeling that's coming from you now. And that will usually automatically trigger them into healing of some kind themselves. Right? So their desire at the moment for alcohol and drugs is all about the suppression of their own emotions of how they feel about themselves. And as you deal with your feelings about men, their feelings about themselves in relation to the woman will heal. Their feelings about themselves in relation to the man are not going to heal until they either choose to do it themselves mm. or their father begins to do it himself. 
Sure, I, I, I'm and you have totally no get over that. that. There, I go to the place. Their life is their business. How yeah. they're choosing to live it, it. Hey, I'm trying to heal mine. Yeah, if you can heal <laughs> that, though, you will have a very positive effect on them. They both feel very bad about themselves in relation to women, um, and and that's something that they, you know, as you heal. And that I that that touches me because obviously that's my influence from my unhealed self. Yes, but again, you see, don't go into blame of yourself okay. now. Because where did your unhealed self come from? Yeah. Do you see? It came, that came from these other situations that were going on in your life that happened when you were young. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So you don't need to blame yourself for it. All we need mm. to do is acknowledge it. Mm. And, and, and anything that we feel about it, feel about it. Mm. And then we will release that. We don't need to go into this shut down blame place. But if you if you can do that, what will happen is the memories of your past will come to you quite, you know, already quite a number have, but but you're getting very close now to being willing to face the real memories. And I really do it? want to embrace the terror. Yeah, yeah. And the terror is a part of those memories. And if you just keep in mind that God's going to nurse you through this process, you've got some lovely spirit friends who want you to heal this through yourself as well. They're going to be with you through the whole process. Even when you don't feel them there, they're going to be there with you. And they'll be nursing you through this process. If you just bear that in mind through the process, you'll be able to have the courage to actually work your way through it. It's, uh, yeah, if, you, if, you, if you forget that, there'll be times when you'll lose your courage. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And just always get back to that connection with God and, the, and have some courage there with that. Thank you. I have been praying about this and... Like here I am talking about it today. Yeah. So thank it's you. very good. Very good you're talking about it. Yeah, if we can go up the back there. AJ, can I just ask you about my two children who are both bedwetters? Yep. And my husband was a bedwetter, I was a bedwetter. Yep. And so I've been... What age did you both wet the bed? Oh, I don't, we both of us don't remember. Okay. Yep. Um, my children are five and eight, did I five say Five and eight, that? okay. Um, and... There's a couple of incidents that I do remember from my childhood. Can I ask the genders of the child? Um, Five-year-old is a girl. Yep. And male is eight. Okay. Yep. And that was interesting the way I said male then. Um, uh, but the incidents I do remember, I was in school one day and um, I didn't go to the toilet in the break and I ended up wetting myself in the class. So yep. that I was grade one. So. And how do you feel that six. time? Well, I try to explore that and I get to the point where... I intellectually think it would be embarrassing and humiliating, but I just shut down. I can't go into anything further than that. So no. it's an intellectual... And I also get this intellectual feeling of powerlessness, but I can't... I just can't sink into it. So there's obviously a terror there that I'm, I'm not accessing. Yep. Before that, when my mother was toilet training me, mm -hmm. um, she didn't realise, but until we moved house, that I was actually going into the bedroom and weeing on the floor, like around the bed. So we had all these patches around the bed. Yep. And so I actually asked her the other day what was going on in our life at that time. And yep. her and dad were really stressed and it came back to them losing their business, having no money. Mm -hmm. So I think it's got some sort of a money attachment too, which is happening in my life right now. All right. Okay. <laughs> That's good. So I'm just getting confused about how to put all the pieces together. Right. So, But it's very good you're investigating your own law of attraction, comparing it to what happened when you were a child. Very good process because you, you can find out a lot in that process. And, um, yeah, bedwetting is caused by terror and fear in a child. And uh, it can be terror of two things. It could be terror in their life, in their awake state, or it can actually be terror in the sleep state too, not wanting to return to their body. Um, to 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 go to the toilet and then go back into the sleep state again. So a lot of times uh, children's lives in their sleep state are much happier than they are in their awake state. And as a result of that, many children don't want to go back to their body even if their body needs to do a wee. And so so they just let it go to the toilet in the bed. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's, a, that's one of the most common reasons for bedwetting. So bedwetting always begins with stress somewhere mm. in the parents. So let's look at what's happening for mum and dad. So what's happening for mum and dad? Oh, you mean me? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought you were talking about my mum and dad. No, no, you. Um, um, my husband and I are about to lose our house because we can't pay our mortgage. Okay, so we've got financial stress. How do you feel about that? Um, overwhelmed. Yeah. 
scared. Scared of where you're going to live and what's going to happen. Insecure. There's unsafe. a debt. There's a debt associated with this house, I assume. Yeah. So huge. you'll be left with a debt yeah. after this occurs. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, w what are the deeper emotions? So you've got financial stress, and that's triggering like pretty big, pretty big fear, isn't it? Yeah. You, right. Yeah. Okay. Underneath that is um, um, insecurity. Uh, um, you know, feeling unsafe. Yep. Um, that's as far as I've gotten. Yep. Okay. So there's some grief, obviously, in there, isn't there? Underneath there, somewhere. Yeah, but I, and I'm not sure what of. Not quite yet. Sure. Um, it's going to be related to your childhood and your and your husband's childhood. So there'll be a law of attraction event involving both of you here. The fact that it's affecting both children also indicates that there's something in both of you with regard to the financial matters okay. uh, related to your own childhood with regard to stress. Does it make sense? Yeah. So it's going to require both of you investigating, not just one of you is going to be able to help the children in this, in this matter. So, um, off, by the way, many of you have uh, deep emotional issues regarding money. Uh, these emotional issues some of you have begun to face recently and some of, the, some of you made comments to me like, I feel like if I don't have money I'm going to die, even it, that bad, you know, like that the, emotional, the emotion is so strong that I might even die if I don't have money. And, and these are often huge panics from multi-generational emotional injuries. And as I'm saying that, obviously there's that connection there for you, right? <laughs> So there's the grief, there's the grief, I'm afraid, and there's terrible grief in that I'm going to die in this situation. And that is the feeling that's affecting the children. So the children are, are wetting the bed, just reflecting those emotions. So the key, uh, the key is to start allowing yourself to really get into this emotion of grief regarding not having financial funds and really start sinking into it in this Law of Attraction event for you both. And I feel both of you have this emotion from your childhood. So I've, I've got a strong feeling that your, father, your, your husband's parents also have gone through some financial, some financial crisis crises in their life and uh, that had a huge effect on him as well. He said to me the other day that he, he actually um, didn't want to sleep in our home the other night because he wanted to go and feel his fear. So we took a... He took a blanket and he went down to the park to feel what it felt like to be homeless. Yeah. And he, he came home and he said to me, I was scared of dying. So he, he had that and he acknowledged that and I had no idea that I had it. Yeah. The, the issue that many of us face, um, obviously many of our parents and grandparents lived through the time of the Depression, for example, um, and, and times like that. Many of our parents and grandparents have been through war situations. Does that make sense? In those kind of situations, there's huge fears of death associated with not having funds, not having a source of income or a source of supply of food, clothing or shelter. And so what happens is these unhealed emotions get built up and the next generation often feels the effect of them quite strongly. And even our law of attraction regarding our own finances often is very, very dependent upon these unhealed emotions. And uh, many of us have to go into them to feel them and release them. So the next generation doesn't have that effect either. So many of our grandparents or parents grew up in this environment where if they, if they had um, any funds whatsoever, they were very, very lucky. And, if, and most of the time they were living right on the edge of their life, many of them, for, for, for long periods of time. In the First and Second World Wars, obviously, for four or five years at a stretch, many of them were living right on the edge of life. The threat of being raped, murdered, killed, you know, bombed, bond, and all these other types of things happening. The threat of death was so real. And then many of us come from, uh, historically come from families that may have lived behind in other war-torn areas in their, in their life. And that has a huge effect on us emotionally because usually those parents don't have the courage to deal with the grief of those emotions. And so they get passed down to the next generation as an emotional injury. So my suggestion is to go, let yourself get a bit of private time and go back into that emotion you were just experiencing. And, and your husband is doing great by going out and being a homeless person for a night and feeling some of that emotion. 
That's the emotion that really does need to be addressed. That's causing huge amounts of emotional stress in the both of you. And when parents are stressed, children react to that stress. Yeah, so they, they will do all sorts of things, acting out that stress, including wetting the bed. Um, I know that this is not the subject that we're on today, but mm. for the first time ever this mm. morning when you were talking, I got the, the, the um, words in my head, oh, I don't want to hear this. And I went, oh, that's interesting, because I do. So I knew it was spirit. Yeah. And um, I went, what is it I don't want to hear? And it was when you were talking about the addiction to having the parents um, love me. Mm -hmm. So it was very interesting, but it was just, you know, because I was ready to walk out and go to the toilet or make an excuse not to be here. But when I asked myself, yeah. what is it that I don't want to hear? It just came so quickly. Yeah. But it was... but. But it was very interesting because I wasn't aware that, you know, I know that you talk about spirits, but it was just so not yeah. what I would normally think. And it yeah. was very powerful. Yeah. So obviously there is some hook between yourself and that yeah. spirit who has that emotion. And in fact, what I would like to do after the uh, break, we're going to have a break now, but after the break what I would like to do is actually for any of you who are mediums who have wanted to ask questions from spirits about these kind of subjects, I'd like to start addressing some of those subjects. The reason why I'd like to do that is there are quite a large amount of spirits with us at the moment who would like to heal a lot of these emotions. And many of them are not feeling like they've been able to have a voice yet. So, um, and they've been waiting for some time to do that. So, so after the group, what we'll try to do is get to their questions about their unhealed emotions. So those of you who have some mediumship ability, who have been sort of impelled by these spirits, if you could be involved in that process. Um, because... Because in the spirit world, healing a lot of these intergenerational emotions is a major, major effort going on at the moment in the spirit world to try to heal these things. Because obviously many of your parents have passed, right? And many of your parents have these emotions still in the first sphere of the spirit world, still having these emotions, not knowing how to deal with them. And the more information we can give the, these spirits about how to deal with them, which basically is the same processes what we've been describing for us here on earth um, but the more we can help them the less multi-generational problems there will be being oppressed on the earth which means that a lot of the damage can be also undone here on earth so i'd like to address that after the break but thanks for your time up to now we'll uh, break for probably should we come back about four or four o'clock and uh, and there'll probably be a couple of hours after four